When Donald Trump assumed the US presidency in 2017, government officials from France, Canada and Mexico issued threats of carbon tariffs against the United States if it withdrew from the Paris Agreement. While Trump did ultimately pull the US out of the Paris Agreement, the dissenting states didn't follow through on their threat. But fast forward to 2021, and here the European Union has announced a proposal for its own carbon tariff, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, or CBAM for short. And this is an important part of the EU's Green New Deal policy suite. The ground is shifting as the momentum towards the decarbonisation of the global economy gains market and now political momentum. So kudos to members of the Poll3 IPP class who've chosen to examine carbon tariffs for your gap analysis, because this is a really important element of this larger story. Let's explore. The EU has a climate master plan to cut emissions drastically over the next decade. It's called Fit for 55, a fitting name for the bloc's goal to slash 55% of its greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. The race starts now. The 2020s is the make or break decade. And that's why Europe has committed to reduce our emissions by at least 55% by 2030 compared to 1990 levels. Here's what it looks like. The European Commission will propose 12 policies targeting energy, industry, transport and the heating of buildings. The list of proposals is long. Tougher EU CO2 emissions for cars could effectively ban sales of new petrol and diesel cars in 2035. EU countries will face more ambitious targets for expanding renewable energy. The measures aim to encourage companies and consumers to choose greener options. For example, a leaked draft of one proposal would tax polluting jet fuel for the first time and give low-carbon aviation fuels a 10-year tax holiday. A revamp of the EU carbon market is also expected to hike CO2 costs for industry, power plants and airlines and force ships to pay for their pollution. Brussels will also announce the details of its world first carbon border tariff, targeting imports of goods produced abroad with high emissions such as steel and cement. That has unnerved EU trading partners, including Russia and China. The political road ahead will likely be rough as EU countries and the European Parliament negotiate the proposals. Already, the plans have exposed familiar rifts between richer Western and Nordic EU states where electric vehicle sales are soaring and poorer Eastern countries that are worried about the social cost of weaning their economies off coal. Policymakers are also braced for a storm of industry lobbying. Well, let us never forget what the cost of non-action would be. Some of Europe's steel and cement sectors due to be covered by the carbon border tariff have said they don't want to be included. Brussels says it's time to take Europe's climate policies global. The World First package would also push EU industry to invest in expensive green technologies, giving European firms a competitive edge in global markets and burnish the EU's global climate leadership position. As we just saw in the Reuters news story, Carbon tariffs are emerging as a key element of this broader evolution of carbon price mechanisms and their rollout across the world. So in this video, I'm going to tease out some of the key issues that arose from that story. First, we'll look at carbon pricing mechanisms in a global context. Then I'll introduce the EU's CBAM proposal. And finally, I'll discuss the potential impacts of the CBAM beyond the European Union. The key economic weapon to address the externality of greenhouse gas pollution is a carbon price. Carbon price mechanisms are designed to force polluting businesses to internalise the cost of greenhouse gas pollution into their cost of business calculations. A well-designed carbon price will prompt businesses to reduce their operating costs by becoming more efficient and reducing their carbon footprint. Now there's several different models of carbon price. Now these range from emissions trading schemes to carbon taxes and hybrid models in between. Emissions trading schemes are based on tradable carbon credits, while carbon taxes impose a flat tax on carbon per tonne. 
Carbon prices are market-based mechanisms. They're designed to send a market signal to spur innovation in low carbon technologies and to increase process efficiencies. So the net result is intended to be a reduction in the carbon emissions of businesses as they reduce their exposure to the carbon price. Now extrapolate that across the whole economy and the end goal is significant widespread emissions reductions. Carbon pricing has been an element of international climate mitigation as far back as the 1997 Kyoto Protocol. And the assumption was that states would establish their own carbon price mechanisms and that they'd eventually all link up together into one global carbon market. However, it didn't turn out this way because individual schemes are not complementary. Different carbon price mechanisms were designed differently there's been a wide variation in the actual carbon prices that exist between schemes. And without full global coverage, there's always the danger that a carbon price in any one country would compel industries to move offshore in a phenomenon called carbon leakage. The key takeaway is that the process of transitioning to either universal coverage of national carbon markets or to one global market is an immensely difficult process. Even two decades after the Kyoto Protocol, with the Paris Agreement, the flexibility given to countries to develop their national action plans to reduce emissions, as well as the lack of enforcement mechanisms in the agreement itself, make it almost impossible for a global carbon price mechanism to be implemented in one hit. So it's in this transition space that the logic of carbon tariffs comes into play. This is what the patchwork of national and subnational carbon pricing instruments looks like globally. On the map illustrated here, those jurisdictions in blue have already implemented emissions trading schemes, while those shaded red and orange have implemented carbon taxes. Global coverage has increased significantly over the past decade, but it still only covers around 25% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And we should also remember that Australia had a hybrid carbon price model during the Gillard Labor government, but that was repealed under the Prime Ministership of Tony Abbott as part of the climate culture wars. The critical drawback of this global patchwork coverage of carbon markets is that much of the world remains subject to no regulation at all or weak regulation. Let's come back to this idea of carbon leakage. So carbon leakage occurs when goods that would normally be purchased locally are instead imported from companies based in countries elsewhere abroad that don't face the same regulations. It also occurs when local companies move their production to other locations overseas to avoid having to cut their emissions. So the result is that com uh, emissions continue to rise unabated and those emissions affect the entire planet it also undermines the cost effectiveness of national greenhouse gas emissions policies. It's in this context of non-universal carbon pricing and where the risk exists of carbon leakage that carbon tariffs have emerged as a complementary instrument. Carbon tariffs tax the carbon emissions embodied in imported goods and thereby extend the reach of a domestic emissions pricing mechanism. Its purpose is to level the playing field with the domestic producers who will be made to pay the carbon price based on their emissions. Before we get to the EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism, we need to start with the EU carbon market to see how the CBAM is intended to work as a complementary instrument. To date, the most comprehensive approach for transnational emissions pricing has been the EU Emissions Trading Scheme, which entered into force in 2005 to set a cap on carbon emissions from energy intensive industry sectors within the EU. Now, an emissions trading scheme is a specific type of carbon price mechanism, as we touched on before. So let's see how the EU's specific model works. In 2005, to limit the emission of greenhouse gases, the European Union decided to introduce the first multi-state carbon market. In 2015, this has become the largest emissions trading scheme in the world. How does the European carbon market work? First, the European Commission defines an emissions cap for a certain time period. 
This cap is then divided and shared between the different market players in the form of tradable allowances. Each allowance represents the right for an industrial plant to emit one tonne of CO2 equivalent. At the end of each period, plants must demonstrate a balance in their allowances and their emissions. They then have four months to return the corresponding allowances to the market authorities. For example, let's consider two companies which are issued 100 allowances each, corresponding to an emission volume of 100 tonnes of CO2 equivalent. If at the end of the year, company A has emitted 120 tonnes of CO2 equivalent, it will have four months to buy the excess allowances from the market, or it may purchase offset credits. The latter represents emission reductions achieved by other geographic zones or in other sectors. Beyond the four-month period, if the company is not in compliance, it will have to pay a fine and provide the missing allowances. Conversely, if company B only emits 80 tonnes of CO2 equivalent, it can bank the excess 20 tonnes for use in future years or sell them to other companies. The European carbon market covers almost 50% of European CO2 emissions and includes almost 16,400 of the most polluting production facilities in the energy and industrial sectors. By 2020, the target is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 21% compared to 2005 and by 43% by 2030. This will be achieved by setting an emissions cap, which will be lowered each year until 2030. How does the carbon price influence the business strategy of companies? Setting a carbon price is meant to help incentivize companies to reduce their CO2 equivalent emissions. Hmm. The company must decide what is the most economical option in the long term. Should it compensate for its emissions by buying allowances, or should it invest in low carbon technologies now? If a company anticipates that the price of carbon will be lower than the cost of reducing its greenhouse gas emissions through technology, then it will most likely prefer to buy allowances or offset credits. If the opposite is true, it will prefer to invest immediately in energy-efficient technologies or in renewable energies or both. The carbon border adjustment mechanism would essentially extend the EU's carbon market to the rest of the world by putting a price on imports to reflect the carbon embedded in them. But as well as pushing up carbon prices in Europe, the EU hopes that this will encourage its partners around the world to raise their climate ambition as well. The CBAM is a central element of the EU's post-COVID economic recovery plan under the European Green New Deal as well as their efforts to meet their declared emissions reduction target of at least a 55% cut in emissions this decade, which is a really ambitious target. While the exact architecture of the CBAM is still being negotiated, the intention is to implement the tariff by 2023. We can see the explicit purpose of the CBAM is to prevent carbon leakage, or in other words, to prevent companies from simply moving their carbon intensive production offshore to avoid the EU's proposed stricter environmental standards. So it follows from this that the CBAM would tax companies that heavily pollute outside of the EU single market at a level that's commensurate with the tax applied within the EU. The industry sectors likely to be hardest hit by the CBAM include coking coal and refined petroleum products, as well as mining and quarrying in general, all of which have really high carbon and trade intensities, as you see illustrated here on this graph. Of the 44 sectors that the EU regards as high priorities for new carbon measures, almost 85% are related to materials, energy, and other sectors that provide raw ingredients for industrial processes. Sectors such as chemical products, basic metals, paper products, and non-metallic mineral products would also be directly affected because of their high carbon intensity. As a part of the EU Green Deal, 
the plans to implement a carbon border adjustment mechanism have raised several questions. At a time when countries are grappling uh, with recovering from the impact of COVID-19, the proposed plan of imposing additional uh, taxes may raise concerns. Though the design of the CBAM uh, is still under preparation, it would be beneficial to engage trading partners in a dialogue and ensure a multilateral approach. The CBAM is unilateral mechanism with multilateral implications. And some key questions that may arise are how would the CBAM be presented at the WTO and how will it fulfill the Paris Agreement and WTO principles simultaneously. The other question would be how would CBAM ensure that it does not affect the foundation of just transition? How would this mechanism impact the multilateral consensus-based approach in climate change and WTO? Some of these questions uh, still need quite a lot of answer. And while the CBAM is still under preparation, it would be very, very critical for the EU to engage with all its trading partners, build an understanding on what the CBAM will be and how will it be implemented. This unilateral approach would lead to significant implications for many of the uh, trading partners, much of them who are developing countries. As illustrated in that short video clip, the EU CBAM could unfairly penalise developing countries. It could impose additional charges of up to 16 billion US dollars on developing country exports to the EU. So not surprisingly, there's been a reaction to that. Governments from the basic group in the UNFCCC, which includes China, India, Brazil and South Africa, have argued that the EU CBAM is discriminatory and inequitable. They've argued that it's a trade barrier that undermines the core principle of common but differentiated responsibilities that's at the heart of the Paris Agreement. On the flip side, the CBAM could be linked with other countries with carbon price mechanisms to form something called a carbon club. A carbon club, so the theory goes, would see other countries erecting carbon borders in a coordinated fashion, establishing a multilateral block similar to a free trade zone, but based around carbon. The logic of carbon clubs is to establish an unstoppable momentum to economic decarbonisation through market signals and create an incentive for states outside of the carbon club to implement emissions reduction measures and carbon pricing so that they can get in, so that they can join the block. Not surprisingly, the governments of the world's most prominent resource exporting countries have been hostile to the EU CBAM proposal. Uh, and that's no exception here in Australia. Our Trade Minister Dan Tehan, as well as Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce, have both labelled the EU CBAM as rank protectionism. And who could forget this clown show moment in 2017 when the then Pre Treasurer Scott Morrison brought a lump of coal to parliamentary question time? So that illustrates where Australia, as it currently stands, is coming from. But vested interests aside, would the EU CBAM be in contravention of the WTO as an unlawful restraint of trade? That's a legitimate question. So the EU's argued that WTO rules would allow a WTO member state to impose tariffs on another member state for failing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But there's conditionalities to this. So this applies if the tariff is enacted solely as an environmental or health measure, and if it's applied in a way that doesn't constitute arbitrary or unjustifiable discrimination or a disguised restriction on international trade. Now, this case is made stronger also if the impacted WTO member states, so those subject to the tax or the tariff, have been shown to have declined to participate in cooperative global action through the Paris Agreement. Now, this is where the phrase Border adjustment is important in the naming and the design of the CBAM, which would be WTO compliant as a levelling rather than a discriminatory measure. It could also pass WTO scrutiny as an environmental exception under Article 20 of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, though this is less likely on its own. A more tangible problem facing the world's climate laggards, like Australia, is the carbon bubble. 
which refers to the threat of investments in projects related to fossil fuels and natural resources that are increasing risk of becoming stranded assets, of becoming essentially worthless. And this is because the carbon bubble, this refers to the unburnable carbon that needs to remain in the ground if the world is to avoid catastrophic runaway global warming. So what's the envelope of this bubble? Well, the International Energy Agency has stated that the burning of all of today's known fossil fuel reserves would result in three times more greenhouse gas emissions than the remaining greenhouse gas budget that we need to operate within to prevent catastrophic impacts. So with this in mind, investment banks and financial institutions are increasingly unwilling to invest in fossil fuel related projects because of the increasingly high risk of stranded assets. This increasingly high risk of investments that they won't see a return on. So this is challenging news for Australia, which is one of the few high income countries without some form of carbon price mechanism in 2021. Australia stands almost alone among high income advanced economies in increasing its emissions from fossil fuel combustion since 2000, 2005. And Australia falls well short of its OECD peers in its emissions reduction commitments under the Paris Agreement. So from the perspective of countries that are making greater efforts to reduce their emissions, Australia's lack of ambition and its lack of a carbon price, that looks more like protectionism than a proposal like the CBAM. So for Australia, our country really is on a collision course between the toxicity of its culture war politics around climate policy and the economic realities of global decarbonisation, which is carrying on apace as we speak. Just to give a brief indication of what that momentum is looking like, it's not just the EU CBAM uh, that's taking off right now. This year, we've also had the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the US President Joe Biden working on a cooperative plan to fight climate change that's likely to include imposing tariffs on imported goods from countries with weak climate laws. A number of other countries, including South Korea and Japan, two of Australia's top four trade partners, have also committed to net zero greenhouse gas emissions targets by 2050. And more importantly, they both have operational carbon price mechanisms as we speak. So imposing carbon tariffs on climate laggard countries is the obvious next step for these countries as well. However you slice this issue, carbon tariffs are becoming an increasingly important feature of the international economy as the process of economic decarbonisation accelerates. So well done to those of you in Poll3 IPP who chose this emerging topic for your gap analysis and do keep an eye on this space. So to summarise, let's read the signals at play here. There's a clear ecological signal of the increasingly frequent and severe climate change impacts that we see all around us, illustrating the obvious threats to life and significant economic damages. There's a clear market signal in the carbon bubble and the accelerating decarbonisation of global energy systems combined with increasing calls for strong climate action from business sectors outside of carbon intensive industries. There's a clear political signal from the, glowing, the growing global climate movement that current action from governments is not enough. So there's political pressure. However, however we also have an international trade architecture that's not well designed for the climate change era and a vision for pricing carbon that remains embryonic at the international level. So this is the context in which carbon tariffs have emerged as a policy instrument for states that want to implement climate mitigation policies without compromising their economic competitiveness. So make no mistake, carbon tariffs are coming.